Hey, this is Sam from Sure. In this video tutorial, I'm going to talk specifically about scan peak classifications, or an aspect of how Wireless Workbench processes scan data and how you can leverage that to get the most compatible frequencies on air. One really nice aspect of Wireless Workbench is its ability to load in scan data from Sure devices or others and process that data to intelligently avoid noisy spectrum when coordinating frequencies. Now, an aspect of processing that scan data is basically the necessity to take certain assumptions about which spectrum is acceptable and which spectrum is not acceptable to put frequencies in. And there's a lot of intelligence that we've tried to build in to uh, make the best assumptions to generate compatible frequencies. Now, part of any assumption is that uh, there are going to be cases where that assumption isn't necessarily true. So what I hope to do today is to demystify some of those assumptions that Wireless Workbench makes and uh, give you the best uh, chance to use the tools provided to get the most frequencies on air that are all compatible. So to set the stage here, I've loaded a scan from a good friend, Dave Mendez, that was taken in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, this scan uh, may look familiar to many of you if you scan in uh, metropolitan areas where there's a lot of DTV on air. You can tell a ton of TV stations are loaded here. Um, and the scan is generally pretty active. So what I want to do is I want to coordinate frequencies. Uh, I'm asking for 160 frequencies of Axiant Digital. I'm being aggressive, feeling lucky today. And I want to show you that in, in the default state of wireless workbench, how it can be pretty difficult to get uh, large frequency counts. And we're going to bend some settings and make some changes to see how those settings can relax and open up some spectrum to get more frequencies on air. So by default, I'm just asking for 160 channels of Axiant Digital in the G57 band with a whole lot of stuff going on in the scan. Let's see what we get. Uh, so this view hopefully isn't familiar to too many of you, but for those who coordinate high, uh, high channel counts, this might be familiar. We found about 65 out of 160 requested frequencies. Well, obviously that's not going to do. So in order to debug this a bit more, what I want to do is show you a little bit of detail about what's going on. So I'm actually going to hide our uh, primary frequencies just so we can get a little bit closer view as to what, uh, what exactly is happening over here. So let me zoom in and you'll notice I've hidden all my primary frequency markers, but still these markers right here persist. What's going on with those? Well, if you've seen some of our other videos, um, you'll notice that uh, any, uh, this orange threshold here or the scan peak threshold currently set at, uh, let's see, 60 dBm, minus 60 dBm, is looking for any scan data that exceeds it. And where scan data does exceed it in a prominent way, like this peak right here, it'll drop this diamond-shaped or this rhombus-shaped marker. And what that is, that's a detected scan peak. So just to summarize in one sentence uh, what another video talks about in a lot of detail, um, scan peaks of a particular uh, magnitude, louder than this, whatever this threshold is set, uh, are so loud that wireless workbench is going to assume, you know, there's probably an active transmitter there. Um, something that may look or feel or smell like a, a wireless microphone transmitter or, or an IEM transmitter. And because something might be there, um, to be safe, I'm going to avoid interfering or getting too close to that scan peak, such that any uh, frequencies that wireless workbench coordinates don't interfere with that carrier. Now, in this particular case, uh, this looks a lot like a DTV station, and treating that leading spike like a wireless microphone or an IEM is probably not the most appropriate consideration. Not only will this thing uh, not interact with my wireless microphones like, an like another wireless microphone might, but chances are the signal level here is either far enough away or so hot that um, I'm going to be more clobbered by this signal, my wireless channels are going to be more clobbered by this signal than, uh, than me potentially clobbering it. But that's neither here nor there. What I want to do is talk about the, the way that Wireless Workbench classifies these scan peaks. So when I hover over this marker, you see uh, the marker, the tooltip reads generic device IMD. What the heck does that mean? Uh, what Wireless Workbench does is it associates basically an equipment profile with any scan peak that it detects. And by equipment profile, I mean, yep, just like you would uh, ask for Axiom Digital channels or uh, channels of any other wireless system from a third party. If I go to this generic manufacturer here, you'll notice there's a collection of these generic device and generic exclusion profiles uh, that Wireless Workbench uses to tie to, um, well, scan peaks it detects. So let's crack open this generic device IMD uh, band, wideband um, a profile to see what's going on. So in the filtering and intermods tab we see wireless workbench is giving detected systems of this type 
holy cow, a really wide berth. 800 kilohertz channel spacing on either side of any detected scan peak, as well as 400 kilohertz insulation from two-tone third order inner mods. Uh, in essence, if you're not familiar with this data, what this means is we are being very polite to uh, this particular carrier, giving it a wide berth uh, from any co-channel operation or two-tone third order intermod um, um, interference from other carriers that we coordinate. Uh, now, that might be appropriate for certain circumstances, but in this particular circumstance, it's not. I don't need to stay that far away from, uh, in this case, a leading DTV spike. I can probably put my frequencies well as close to this spike as they're comfortable with being close to. So what I might want to do is use one of the other built-in generic profiles that we build in. So this, if a profile is called generic device, um, what we have done is we've built in basically some channel spacing. Uh, making sure that we uh, frequencies we coordinate stay a certain distance away from this particular spike. Generic exclusion basically zeroes out all the channel and IMD spacing and just makes sure that we don't avoid a direct hit by landing right on top of that guy. So what's this IMD, no IMD? Um, well, things that are intermod sources or things that may generate intermods with other systems that generate intermods um, wear this IMD name. And actually what it is is basically just a name to reflect the fact that we are considering this type of uh, system, this peak, an intermod source. If you don't think that that particular spike is a, an intermod source, you can select a profile that's called no IMD and you see that checkbox goes away. So these profiles, all right, that's all good and fine, Sam, but uh, quit showing us the Excel table and show us a demo. Ask and you shall receive. So what I can do is on a spike by, or a peak by peak basis, I can right click and change the profile of any of these peaks to be a different, um, a different one of those uh, generic profiles that we created, or I could select a custom profile called something like Assure UHFR. But what's a little bit more handy is I can change the default profile that Wireless Workbench applies to all these scan peaks. And to do that, I'll go into the Coordination Preferences. And in the uh, General tab, you'll see this uh, preference, Classify Peaks Above Scan Peak Threshold As. And I can change this to, again, one of those generics or select a custom one. So just to show you the impacts, right now we're on, on the most conservative one, generic device IMD. Let me select the same channel spacing, but assume it's not going to create intermods. And let's just see if that has an impact. So I'll select that. You'll notice that uh, when I save this setting, all of my filled in diamonds go to hollow to reflect they're not gonna generate intermods anymore. And instead of 65 frequencies, I've already found 90, well 93, almost 50% more frequencies, just by assuming those scan peaks are not gonna create intermods. Now far be it for me to tell you whether or not these peaks are gonna create intermods or not, that's a judgment you have to make, but I wanna show you that the mechanisms are built in to be a little bit more aggressive. So we jump from 65 to 94 just by assuming those scan peaks are not going to create um, intermods. Let's go a step further and assume that not only are we going to um, not create intermods, but let's assume we don't need to give these things channel to channel spacing. There's no need for an 800 kilohertz wide berth. We'll turn it into a generic exclusion, meaning no direct hits, and that these things aren't going to generate intermods. And when I do that, you'll see, um, I bet you will see a jump from 94 to, let's see, oh, an egg on my face. About the same. Maybe we'll squeak out a couple extras. But th these tweaks that we've done are really just a, a reclassification of how Wireless Workbench interprets scan data that we load in right there. We haven't even begun to tweak the compatibility spacings associated with, uh, in this case, Axiom Digital. And you'll notice instead of using uh, the standard profile, I could choose to use more frequencies, which is a little bit narrower spacing, and we drop off our consideration for our um, distance from two-tone third-order intermods. And when I press calculate, boom, we're in business. All 160 frequencies. Let me turn it back on so we can see our, oh, our loaded bandwidth of glory. So, you know, I want to cut the tutorial off there, but uh, what I wanted to make sure you saw was that the automatic detection and classification of scan peaks in Wireless Workbench is something that you've got a, control over, and B, uh, if you really can uh, customize the way that the application uh, responds to and associates equipment profiles to, uh, well, to make the most appropriate uh, considerations when importing spectrum data. So I hope this tutorial was helpful. If you've got any questions or comments, please be sure to leave them down below. Thanks.